Good morning and welcome to your Daily Game Face. I'm Dr. Kim Landon. I'm here with Lou Blasey. Good morning, Lou. Good morning. How are you? I'm all right. My tooth is bugging me. I know. You get all kinds of issues this morning. I always have issues. Yeah. It's the only place I can talk about my issues. <laughs> I did. So I was just telling you What is you that, that about me, that people talk about their issues with me? <laughs> you talk about my issues. I jammed um, a piece of... Um, I think rosemary when I was eating something this week a couple days ago up behind one of my gums and my front tooth is mm, mm. And I don't want to have to go to the dentist and now I see this thing and it's bugging me so those are my problems for the day did, did you YouTube it or Google it or agitating well how to remove something from under your gum I can't even think about that that's like sticking something up my nose Ugh. God. Maybe not. There may oh, be an extraction I can't even, technique. I'm never going to be able to have yeah. LASIK surgery on my eyes because I can't do that either. Here I am a doctor, but I can't do those things. I'd be a very bad... Well, I've had one cataract done, so... <sighs> LASIK can't be that bad. No, I'm just cataract was, to knock me out. Cataract thing was fun. Because you're awake and conscious while you're watching I'm them I'm aware. That's why I said you have to knock me out. <laughs> while you're watching them cut into your eye. Ah, stop it. <laughs> you're giving me the visual. There's only so many things I can take that's as fine. a doctor. It's fine. And that's it one a... thing I don't. I can do everything else but that. It was a fine procedure. It was no problem. <sighs> so, <laughs> anyway, last week mm -hmm. we were talking about, at the end of the show, the thing I was going to talk about for the whole show and start off. But so... And then I got all distracted because I couldn't think of the word because I was so... But it's... So we're going to talk about anosmia or anosmia. So you can think of it as nose, like your nasal passageways. Speaking of noses and mouths and the eyes. Um, but sensory organs and, and psychology and neuroplasticity, but anosmia or anosmia. Um, I was talking about it like last week because 80% of the population that has received the diagnosis of COVID-19 has suffered from anosmia and it's how much 80 percent 80 percent so it's it's in my mind as a doctor it's like the number one thing I always ask people like did you lose your taste and smell yeah. do you have that, that everything else because most of the time that's yes and so that's been the diagnostic for a lot of my colleagues and a lot of you know people in general like oh I lost that that must be the sign um but it's an interesting um phenomenon that happens i mean because it does happen in people anyway as you get older you can have um traces of your the little cilia hairs in the back of your olfactory area start to die off as mm -hmm. you get older so you see that a lot more like in parkinsonian people alzheimer's patients Lewy body dementia um for some reason there's well, I know the reason, but there's uh, Alzheimer's and dementia types and vascular dementias tend to have like cell death and neuroplasticity death. So, um, um, but anosmia is very interesting in terms of psychology and uh, the APA, the American Psych Association was... Wait a second, is that for Alzheimer's patients, dementia patients, things like that, is that a leading indicator? Is that a trailing indicator? Is that a symptom of... It's a trailing indicator. Trailing indicator. Because... Um, there's a couple different theories on it around the fact that because of the the matter, the gray and white matter in the brain, and the changing and the and the placking that happens, that it's um, yeah. damaging the temporal lobe and damaging the olfactory, and so they're connected. I see. Um, so that's one of the main. So it's theories. a symptom of. Yes. Yeah. So, but oftentimes you'll see that, and so people. Um, I don't know if you've been around people with Alzheimer's or dementia in the later stages. Not um, declared, anyway. <laughs> well, I did come in today and tell you that you were dementing the, today. Um, but the the later stages, you'll see a lot of times people lose their appetite. And there was a whole bunch of research done around, was it really that people were losing their appetite or was it that they lost their smell right. with anosmia, which is the trigger of the of the big parts of the cortex of the brain to actually give you like memory of wanting to eat good connections to, you know, right. um, you know, something that you've had good happen in your life, like Christmas smells or holiday smells or whatever. Right. So there's all these different pieces that go with the psychology of it that trigger you to eat so um very interesting that you know in those in those types of disorders that that is a it, i mean it could be a, a front or a trail or somewhere yeah. in between it's it's in there because it's um it stops people from being able to function the proper way well i asked because anecdotally yes i do not have a sharp sense of smell well you probably have some cell death in your cilia in yep. your olfactory yeah mm -hmm. but it's been for a long time and it's just again 
just anecdotally, people said, you smell that? And you go, no, I really okay. don't. <laughs> well, and, and so you know that, so it, people have ranges, obviously. So if you had something happen, you know, a lot, a lot of times people say, why is my sense, you know, whether it's hearing or seeing or whatever, going or has gone, there's usually something that's happened. People often will lose their sense of smell because, I mean, if you're a smoker, and you've been smoking for chronic years, then you're more likely not to have your smeller come back, you know. Yeah. And when people, uh, you know, their taste buds go really down, almost nothing because the smell and the, you know, the, there's a lock and key theory around how that goes together. So you can't sure. put that together. So, and also trauma, if you have like a brain injury, you have a concussion. Concussions, I was going to ask. Or anything yeah. like that. So I don't know if you ever had those kinds of things, but you'd I've be had more. concussion too. Right. So the that would player. be yeah. a possibility of yeah. leading to that. Or syphilis. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, or syphilis. Yeah. I mean, there's, a, you know. Yep. <laughs> Um, but that's, you know, those are on the extreme list, but those are things that can cause it. But generally speaking, people who lose their smeller is usually something that you can connect it to, Yep. you know, and then age, but not as much as like something like a concussion or brain injury or, or some kind of really specific disorder that comes along or temporal lobe, like you get whacked in the temporal lobe, which is, you know, the two lobes over your ears, those can create a problem into your olfactory sensory hmm. area possibly okay um so all right so now i lost where i was where was i <laughs> i was talking about oh the psychology of it yeah and and going into the um why why i was bringing it up last week is because so many people are talking about their senses being damaged and and not coming back and so um i have you know some friends and colleagues and whatever that have had covid and then like one friend never got their smell and taste back for the things that they were eating on the day of the loss of the smell and taste. That's very specific. Very specific. And so, and then I have people who've gotten all of it back and then I have like sort of the in-betweeners. And so, um, and so I was asking people like, well, how does it impact you? And, um, and then I went and did some extra research and it's quite the phenomenon about the fact that people are struggling with, you know, they're putting extra salt, which you put extra salt in something to make it taste good. Great. But yeah. the problem is, is now what are you doing to your body? Right. <laughs> and then, or sugar, or you're trying to, you know, more garlic, which, hey, that's great. Um, you might smell though. <laughs> that's typical of uh, people when you get older because you lose your taste buds and you tend to over season. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, well, and so going back to the Alzheimer and dementia. So when I was working on the unit, I think I mentioned this last week when I was working on the dementia unit, the special care unit, in the morning, you would all the smell of the unit was always so striking to me yeah. because the um, intensity of like the breakfast, maple syrup and eggs. Like I will never forget working on. And you when you go into many nursing homes or whatever, yeah. the breakfast lingers all day in the smell, and it's. Um, I don't know specifically if there's any research on that, but I know between colleagues we always would talk about like that gets you up in the morning it gets people moving it's you know that smell comes in it has to be strong yeah. so um but so, i'll never forget that kind of smell so after you looked into this did yes. you find any um other stories about people losing taste for the thing they were eating at the time that they got covid um so yeah so there's because there's... the mechanics of that are fascinating so there, there's a lot of people who are reporting that it's the things that they were eating or they were, do, that's what they noticed on that day or that I have, and then I have someone that this, I thought this was fascinating that they don't smell bleach. They knew that they, there was a problem and here's another danger, right? They, they didn't smell the bleach and somebody in their house said, do you smell how much bleach you've used? <laughs> and they were like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And they couldn't smell the bleach. So they still can't smell that. Again, spe specifically, like a keyhole, bleach was an issue? The bleach thing was an issue. They were basically okay otherwise, but couldn't right. smell bleach. Right. Wow. So Fascinating. It's it's absolutely fascinating. And I I mean, there's so many different theories on anosmia that you, that you can look at to come up with it. So clearly my theory, putting my puzzle together, is that in those cases, there must have been either because... COVID tends to go to respiratory, so it's going to go to that section and probably kill off the cells in some way because it attacks cells. Um, and that would be the entry point in a lot of cases, right? Right. Yeah. And so given that it's coming through the nose and into the lungs, I would imagine that that's, you know, maybe right at the beginning when it first hit yep. that person and that's when it happened, that that was 
something that killed off the cilia and you need all the little hairs in your nose to be able to detect and it just the virus killed it um, now neuroplasticity wise like the neurology of the brain would say that we would be able to regenerate especially in younger people right um, we'd be able to regenerate and have um, that come back so you you would imagine that people that are getting it back it's because it's regenerating or re or um reset different memories you eat what you were eating at the time and right you get the smell and create the memory memory there right exactly like a second set or something right new so you, files <laughs> so it, well it's interesting because um the the memory piece of it is so uh important because it's the, you know, it's damaging. You imagine it's got to be damaging the um, the limbic system, which is your emotional center, mm -hmm. and not damaging it in like a, I was like, not in a bad way, damage. But <laughs> it's it's disallowing the hippocampus, your memory maker, to memory make. So because it's cutting off the source of being able to make the memory, so you can't regenerate. Yeah, see, that's all fine, but specifically for, you know, pork chops or whatever the hell you were having at the time, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, I don't I don't understand the mechanism. I, well, you know, yeah. I, I only know what I know. No, I know. <laughs> I'm just pursuing it. I'm, I'm talking it so through. I, I mean, I I mean, it makes sense to me in the fact that that it could be so strong of the virus and that person at that very second that that was happening as sort of like a coincidence that they, you know, maybe if they hadn't been cooking at the time for like seven, 10, 12 hours, right at the beginning when they got it, maybe that wouldn't have happened that way. But because it was happening while they were doing X, Y, and Z to eat or to clean or whatever. Could uh, that, could it be associative? In other words, um, I have, this is a revelation, but I had a bad experience with Jack Daniels when I was younger. And to this day, the smell of Jack Daniels turns you. Turns me, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've, I've associated that memory with that smell very and strongly. That's, and that's and that's normal to happen. Yeah. So that we so we in our in our in our cerebral cortex, we make the memory that associates to good or bad or something in between. That's why we have the memories of holidays or right. like smelling grass in the spring or smelling rain coming or like I can smell snow coming. Growing up can in you? Vermont, I can detect like snow in the air. It's yeah. weird. I know. But S sausage we, at Fenway. Uh, sausage at Fenway, yeah. popcorn, you know. Yeah. Um, but we make memories for the negative too because we, we will recall that. So I don't have Jack Daniels, but yeah. I have... I haven't eaten a Salisbury steak since I was about five years old because I will. I can vividly remember the smell and the feeling of me having Salisbury steak and then throwing up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And and I can see it playing in my head right now. I'm like, and I haven't had that since. And I'm like, this is the thought of it right now. I can smell it. And I'm like, Ugh. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm having the <laughs> 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 because we're associating the the memory. Um, that we have with the smell. It's like, kind of like if I say, okay, start thinking about lemons. You can associate the actual sensory of your taste buds with your nose to be able to create the saliva in your mouth because we're going to the motor cortex and we're going into the cerebral cortex to really pull the memory out of the hippocampus because yeah. it's associative. So I would imagine to that theory that when COVID strikes people and that this phenomenon happens, they're probably seems likely that there's some associative effect to yeah. have that happen. It's a, it's interesting how strong smell and memory is, how the connection is. Yes. I was doing a ghost hunting show, and a woman called up, and she was talking about an experience she had with her past father mm -hmm. because she could smell his tobacco mm -hmm. um, in her house. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, it's not because he was there. It's because you thought of your father, and the smell came up with it. Uh -huh. You know, it's just a very strong smell. And we've all got that, like a sausage, sausage at Fenway, car smell, you yeah. know, something like that. We all we all have those smells that associate, you know, pizza at the beach, that type of thing. Well, now I know all of yours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> pizza at the beach. Yeah. Well, everyone's got them, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. and, and that's so, but this is such an important piece of why I bring this up is not necessarily to talk about anosmia, but to talk about how sensory information shapes our experience and shapes the meaning of our lives, good, bad, and indifferent. So, um, and how important it is that um, people who get depressed or anxious, when their sensory deficits 
increases the likelihood of depression and anxiety and other issues in people because it lowers the quality of your life because you know hearing loss sight loss you know it's depressing or the fact and you do what i wouldn't have thought it's depressing and it's stressful because right. your um defense mechanisms your primal urges are based on what you can perceive exactly so when you perceive less you're more stressed out Exactly. And, and, and you have to, and so there's so many pieces to this because the sensory information, like you just said, also, you know, gives you fight or flight response, our basic primal needs, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like making sure we stay safe and protected and watch for danger. Like that's all of our sensory information, skin, sight, ears, right. taste, touch, mm -hmm. right? So what an important thing that people I don't think realize that those sensory pieces really impact your emotional well-being because it gauges you constantly throughout the day and keeps your body regulated in a lot of ways because you know something bad smell you move out of a, an environment obviously toxicity or something yep. looks dangerous you you get out of the way or you have a sensory information on your skin that something bad is on you or near you heat too much fire whatever mm -hmm. it is but man if you don't have those detectors which a lot of people lose i mean you know you have people who have been in chronic addiction and they lose sensory information on their skin because you know, overuse of cocaine over years will tap out like nerve endings and then you have numbness in certain parts of your body. Yeah. So you can't detect heat or cold or whatever. And you can become hypothermic faster. Or you can get close to a fire and burn. You don't even realize it. Um, I mean, so there's so many pieces that go into just every day yeah. making meaning of your life that have to do with, you know, um, staying centered in neuroplasticity which is is really yeah. the big piece here is your body is constantly generating neural pathways over and over again to make sure that your sensory information is giving you the right information so that you stay healthy yeah and and when you do things in your life to damage you know like going to anosmia like smoking you know if you're doing something to damage a sensory piece to you Wow, you know, you don't yeah. realize when you're doing it unless somebody's telling you that that's gonna um, impact you like that until it actually says, "Oh my God, I can't smell anymore." <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that's a big, you, and you miss out on but a that's big the, piece of life. That's the frog in the pot type right. of thing with sensory issues because it's not generally generally you don't just lose them. Generally, you just they just dull over time, so right. you, you know you don't even realize. Except in the case of COVID, yeah, it goes like that. yeah, exactly, yeah, right. It's like immediate kill kill yeah. switch on it, right? But yeah. yeah, so you, and I think that because it's like a diffusion of the responsibility over time of the sensory loss in other disorders or whatever, like yeah. or if you're I mean, smoking's the easiest one to use, you don't realize it until it's over the edge, like you've gone over the cliff on it already, right. and yeah. it's like oh my god, I can't smell or I can't taste, and then it's like uh, people get so used to it that it's you know. Well, it's, it is what it is, and they'd rather keep the, you know, addiction to yeah. that than, than worry about the smelling piece, you right. know. Um, but, uh, you know, so people have been asking me, well, how do you treat, how do you treat this loss of smell? So they are doing, a, um, it's a glucose steroid, essentially, um, to, and I don't know if lots of people are using it, but that's the main treatment for mm -hmm. anosmia in general, is like they do a glucose steroid or a glucocorticosteroid. Um, so it's like, you know, sugar, a sugar steroid combination. And yeah. it's, but it doesn't have, from everything I've read and seen, I don't think it has great effectiveness. Um, sort of a mixed bag. <clears throat> so... I'm sort of just saying like people for people to be mindful of if they do have that be patient because some people get their smeller back right away and I've seen people now take eight months and still not have it back. I was so, going to say do we have a demographic on this? I do not and because recovery times are all over the map all over right the place right. even that loss of, even that loss of smell is right is body in the in the diagnosis right exactly oh you said 80 well, percent experience well, some 80 percent of yeah. like popular of the people that have reported having it mm -hmm. have that but but so anecdotally the people that i know have had um covid um the majority have gotten their taste back pretty quickly but then there's those outliers that were you know eight months out but i also think with covid the problem we face is that there is so much that is unreported Mm -hmm. In other words, I, I think we had this discussion yeah. last March or April yeah. when I thought we were millions of cases in already. Yeah. And, you know, nobody knew. And I, I kind of stand by that. And I think I a lot of people. I stand by that, too. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people have had COVID and didn't know because it was relatively mild symptoms. Right. And, yeah. 
Well, it's, I was just saying, um, we've talked about this. I mean, so many people now, if we go back retrospectively, right? So many people in my life, John, you know, my husband, he had, we think he had it coming in de- uh, November, December, coming into COVID last year, like not this past year, but the right before right. it hit, so to speak. And the reason why is because after it actually hit, he had had a good month and a half of hard time breathing. He lost his taste and smell. We just thought he had a terrible cold and it just couldn't kick. Oh, I've got a good percentage of people who are reporting December, January. They really feel they, they had it. December, right. January of last right. year. Of, yeah. la- of last year, yep. right? Not 2020, but right. coming into 2020. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then my friend um, recently um, was had struggled in January this year, like December, January, and he was like his O2 level dropped really low and he had some other issues going on, like some diabetes and some other stuff, you know, so we all were just like, okay, this is, you know, yeah. other stuff, right? Yeah. But then just recently he was doing like a sleep study and the doctor um, that was associated with the sleep study and doing other tests on him because his O2 went back up to normal. And so uh, the doctor was like, you had COVID and it just <laughs> really? didn't even like, but we don't, you know, it was much later. So we couldn't like do anything about it. Was a doctor speaking anecdotally or did he have antibody results? Or? He did not have antibody yeah. results, but because of the way, you know, cause he was short of breath and yeah. he didn't, but he didn't have a loss of taste and, and smell, but he had the shortness of breath and he um, had the O2 level drop. Right. And he was like really, really pale. And well, with other medical issues, that's going to hit on certain symptoms. And so we symptoms. just went right yeah. for like, it's got to be the diabetes issue. It's got to be some other stuff going on, like mm-hmm. something's not processing correctly or whatever. And um, and then he was having sleep trouble, which is why he went right. And then the doctor that finally saw him, I think it was a, a pulmonologist that he saw. Maybe I could be talking out my butt. Yeah. But he saw, but the doctor was like, wait, repeat what you had. And then, he, so going to the point of like, how many people have had these things and not even realized that, because we... And I'm around this all the time, and I didn't even think of that because this is a person that doesn't leave the house, really, doesn't go into stores, doesn't do it, like, and is really self-contained. You think, well, how could? Well, they have kids. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and kids are really resilient, so, you know, they're in and out, in and out, and you figure, oh, my God, all these kids have been going in and out to school and doing other things and working, and so probably brought it in, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's crazy how many people... And as we said, I think there was... So in March, there's three, four months of activity before it became a thing here Right in March. So, right. the, so there were At people least. who ha- say they haven't gone out during COVID were probably out in December and January right. and February. Right, yeah. exactly, exactly. So, yeah. I, and I, so I, think, I think that um, it'll be interesting to see the research that comes out. I'm always fascinated by that, like the research that comes out down the line here of like what symptoms came, how they've resolved out, are there long-term effects? Because yep. I'm sure they're going to do, especially on the anosmia, because it's so fascinating. Because it's so, it's like number one. It's yeah. like most people have this, and um, so in one of the connecting points I wanted to talk about about the neuroplasticity is in in the psychology of it is that um, so our hippocampus um, is our memory maker essentially in our emotional self, and when we have a lot of stress, so like say you say you can't smell, you can't taste, and so now. You, it brings your enjoyment of life down. Like imagine if sure. you couldn't taste your pizza or you couldn't right. taste your favorite thing already, right? When it brings that sense of enjoyment down in your life and you start getting like maybe stressed out or you already have stress, cortisol, which is your stress dump, right? Cortisol directly impacts the hippocampus. It's like the biggest, it's where we carry the most of it. When we get stressed out, it goes right to the really? memory maker. Yeah, And so it has it's this interesting loop because it directly connects into disconnecting your memory or you know when people say oh, i'm so stressed out and i feel so discombobulated and i can't it's because the hippocampus is trying to keep up with the cortisol dump that's going on to try to really keep it together so people will look like they have cognitive decline or they'll look like they're <laughs> impaired and they can't remember or they you know when you're really stressed out and you put so your, does that infect short term memory storage and yeah right yeah. because it's shut it's sort of shutting it off because it's putting a big dump of cortisol and stress in you in your hippocampus and you know you end up putting your keys in the refrigerator <laughs> if you can't find your keys. Yeah. I may have done this on occasion. <laughs> Not the in, a re- phone. in a refrigerator? The phone. Yeah. What? In the refrigerator? You put your keys I have put the, the keys in the refrigerator. Not in a long time. And, yeah. uh, you know, you go to put the phone. Or you have stress and you're, you're looking for your phone, but you're holding it. Have you had that happen? 
No, no, not quite. That's oh, not one I've had. Isn't yeah. that bad? I'm like, yeah. I'm like looking for my phone and it's in my hand. Mm. Or the keys to the car in my hand and I'm looking for them. Yeah. The other day I had, I have a key rack yep. for keys, obviously. And I have a coat rack and I put the keys on the coat rack. I found that the other day. See? Yeah. You must have had a little stress that day. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I was. See? Yeah. So, so, while I was taking off my coat, something you, else was going on. I, my attention was elsewhere. Right. Yeah. So and and so that's the hippocampus. So your your hippocampus is your you know it's learning, memory, short yep. term. It stores. It's where you get. You know, so super important that you know that like all your sensory information, all your sensory information from all five senses goes right to the hippocampus. And so when you're really stressed that's out, that's the distribution area. And it's what? That's the distribution area. That's well, where that's, your sensory information. So goes. your sensory information gets channeled into all your different areas but the hippocampus is the one where you're you're going to make the memory related to yep. like oh don't touch the fire because it's hot yep. you know um that the ghost pepper will kill you you might not want to do that you know <laughs> yeah. stuff like that so any any of the senses is going to go through and filter through the, the hypoth i mean the um the thalamus region which is the relay station for all your emotional centers which is the hippocampus for memory and so when you lose a sensory piece your hippocampus diverts to other sensory places and when you have cortisol dumping and you're a high stress a high anxiety person yeah your hippocampus is constantly working so when you when i see people that say you know i just can't concentrate on my reading i can't concentrate on the tv show i it's because there's so much literal cortisol dumping and going right back and forth and, and channeling that it's just hard to stay focused so that's why you know, doing meditation and meditation isn't being hokey. It's about being right. like just taking a couple of seconds to take a couple of deep breaths, really slowing your brain down by lowering your heart rate so that you can stop the cortisol dump to function by centering yourself. And people are like, oh, that doesn't work. It does actually work. And we know oh, it, it absolutely works. works. And it's amazing how quickly it can work if you actually just practice it a couple of times a day, because what it's doing is it's disconnecting. I mean, this is loose for the listeners is yep. it's disconnecting the channel of the cortisol to that area of the brain to allow it to relax to say okay like get yourself together yeah <laughs> and relax you know so when you're saying chill out you're really telling that center of the body to go chill but back to the vital skill of being able to put things down for a while right even if it's 15 minutes or half right. an hour and it doesn't even have to be meditation just kind of no. you know well and it goes like even the an commercial... episode of baywatch <laughs> <laughs> while eating pizza and, do and hot dogs from or sausages from Fenway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be Baywatch. great. I, yeah, love, I yeah. love how I'm piecing your puzzle together. Yeah. I love it. I, I have this image of you sitting watching Baywatch no. and eating pizza. What? <laughs> but no, you just, you have to get the, you have to have those points in your day where you can set things down. Right, exactly. Say, this and is going to be there tomorrow. There's nothing I can do about it right now. I'm going to be here. I'm going to spend the time with my dog or my kid or Baywatch or whatever it is and it doesn't have to be a full meditation it can be exactly yeah and so so meditation is just one way but time in the garden a walk time, time in the garden walk yeah. um you know going to pets i mean you know you and i both love our pets so that's if you have a fur baby that is one of the best by the way that's the reason you love the fur baby the way the way you do the way that's people love I'm animals to say. You interrupted yeah. me yeah okay <laughs> Getting there. Low. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why, yes. So the fur babies in our lives provide a way of, just by petting. I mean, so in my animal assisted therapy that I do, um, you know, Kalila, the cat that I passed four years ago, yep. uh, God rest her soul. Um, she provided like, she was such a calm, she was a wackadoo, but she was a calm yep. cat. And so she was so good at being able just to be pet by, people like with trauma yep. because trauma and anxiety sit in those parts of the brain and when you're touching something that's loving you back like an animal and there's a bond there it lowers your heart rate which lowers your cortisol dump which disconnects that yep. that bad connection to the brain of overloading you into either a trauma response or anxiety threat generating response and so our fur babies provide you know, if you don't take meditation time, if you just like I left today and I made sure I kissed all the babies, right? Because it's just a centering thing for my brain, but also it's a calming thing to be able yeah. to say, ah, oh, that felt nice because it's so um, 
relieving to have a place to do that. And so if you don't have a fur baby, that's okay because then there's other ways. But sure. if you do, that's a such a benefit to their relationship. That's why I always am so crazy when I see people like abuse their animals. And I'm like, ugh. Yeah. Like, you know, abuse, that's a whole thing. You yeah, abuse your animals whole and thing. abuse your kids and yeah. Yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, not whatever, but uh, such a, a different thing. So yep. it's, it's um, the neuroplasticity in the brain um, has reparative qualities when you have a fur baby and that you're connecting with them because that's why we have animal assisted therapy in hospitals now. That's why we bring in horses. Right. That's why we have, you know, dog and cat therapy. I mean, it's just because, and we know the um, way that the sensory information gets reallocated into the cor into the cerebral cortex to make the memory to have the hippocampus and the amygdala the big words today, and yep. the hypothalamus, all regulate. Those are the three areas of the brain that are your emotional center. So when you have soothing things like taking a walk or, or listening to the calm app for 10 minutes or sitting quietly somewhere and just being with yourself, which is hard for people, um, any of those things helps that sensory information calm itself so that you can actually feel better. Yeah. And people take that for granted. Um, people have a hard... I, I do an exercise in my office with clients that, you know, just to center. And I ask people, if they can, to close their eyes. And some people with trauma response can't do that, which is can't? fine. Can't? Really? Can't? Oh, no. Oh. A lot of people who have trauma... Um, anecdotally, most of my veterans who I work with who've been in war yep. cannot do the exercise with their eyes closed. Over time, I have a couple that can, but not for the sustained period because it's a trust issue of the sensory information. When you shut your eyes, you don't know what's coming. So, but being able to do the exercise of just being able to, we're going to spend the next three minutes just listening in the room. And then we do that. So it's, you know, hyper focusing on one sense or smelling everything in the room. Um, or noticing in the room something you haven't seen before. So it's just really teaching someone how to just be calm by just centering on one sense. Yeah. Um, and it's and it works beautifully because you're distracted away from the worries that you were having. It disconnects immediately the cortisol shoot from you know the pancreas up to the brain and drops it. Um, and the person has a you know a great response. That's why I love the Calm app. And, and I, I don't get reimbursed for any of this, but I love the Calm app because, you know, even on TV, you'll see the take 30 seconds and the, it's no commercial yep. talking, but it's just the 30 seconds. And I'm like, I always watch it. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Because I can actually feel the disconnect happen of yep. the calm come over and then immediately it's over. And then I'm like, oh, right back to, right back to me normal. Yeah. But you've got a, you've got a skill set behind that, so you yeah. can be effective in that thirty yes. seconds. But too many people think that this whole process we're talking about is lotus position and and you know right. two hours Insane. sitting in a room for two hours. Yeah, and it, it's not what it's about all the time. No. You can do it in your car. Yep. You do it involuntary. You do it in the car. Actually, you do it in the shower. Even people who don't think they do it. Right. They check out in a car. Right. It's disconnect time. Yeah. Well, that's and so because there's nothing else they take, can take care of. Or what instead of what they're doing right now. Well, I mean, they get on the phone now. Well, they get on the phone, right? Yeah. So, um, well, that's so, you know, before COVID, that was one of the things I would have people do is the, their drive time from their office to their home or their home to their office was disconnect time so yeah. that they could do the transition so that they could be shut that piece off and then re enter as who they're supposed to be in their home or in their work. Right. So they weren't bringing them across the boundaries. Um, so I've been doing that with people now, but in their homes, obviously the COVID people haven't gone into work, so they're doing their work from home. So I've made sure that a lot of people who are struggling with this, that they designate their office area as their office area so that when they walk out into the kitchen, it's not right. not extension because people, it got so blurry for so many people and you know, anger went up, yep. domestic violence went up, you know, all these things because people are up each other's yah yahs. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's that it's that being able to disconnect uh, so many things because it really works well in the brain and it helps your brain regenerate from the even the trauma of being overexposed to things or from being taxed out or yep. stressed out and and the importance of that and people take people take their senses for granted and don't realize that your sensory information is really what is a big impact on your emotional life. 
and um, your thoughts are not your feelings, but what you think and how you feel in sensory combination is tremendous. And, and it does a, um, an imprinting job on your brain. And so you have these neural pathways that are getting rerouted all the time. And if you're constantly in like a negative yep. neural pathway um, and you have negative experiences or something feels bad, you're going to keep going down that track. And so you have to have one of these kind of disconnecting um, moments either by walking or fur babies or reading or whatever it is so that you can move the train to a different track to, yep. to lay new tracks. And people who are anxious tend to have those well, very back, deeply rooted train tracks in their brain. We're back to the observer position. Yes. Pe people don't understand that they can turn off the sensory information. or not, not necessarily turn it off, but they can disconnect from it. Right. Right, for a period of time. And it's like it's not something you want to do full time. Right. But it, there are periods when it can help. And by the way, as I again challenge everybody, think back of the best times in your life. They were because you stepped out of the noise. Right. You, you know, the noise floor lowered. You were just where you were. You were just in the moment. And you were just enjoying what was in front of you instead of being stressed out about everything that was happening to you. Well, and so so when you're talking about that, that's this great documentation about how the European countries really do vacations right versus the U.S., right? Yeah. Because... Um, Europe takes six to eight weeks. A lot of places give six to eight weeks off, right? Mm -hmm. and we get one, two, three, you know, depending. And, you know, but in European countries, they do multiple blocks of time that you can take off. And there's good research around why that's true. And it's to your point is that um, when you take like a week vacation, by the time you're into your fourth day of vacation here, and you've probably had this experience because I do and yep. most people I know, fourth day the experience of a fourth day of vacation no i don't, don't remember that Listen experience yeah the, by the fourth day of seven day vacation is yeah. the first day you typically are feeling like oh, right right and now you're already starting to ramp up to leave to right. leave to go home yeah. so it takes x amount of time you know three to four to five days to even ramp down from the disconnect of work and home and caretaking and all the things that your responsibilities, let alone like TV, social media, phones, blah, blah, blah. And then by the time that you're halfway through your vacation, you're feeling relaxed, but then all of a sudden your fifth day, you now you're ramping up to get ready to leave to go back to what you, yeah. so, so in your, in European countries, they give huge amounts of time and there's a deficit to this too but in terms of just being able to shut off and relax what a great way to have people have healthier lifestyles because they get more time to really decompress and check right. out from the constant running of the brain and and we don't do that here are you familiar with the marshmallow experiment the one well there's depends on which one you're talking about are you talking about the putting the marshmallow in front of the child yes oh yeah yes i am yeah yes uh the marshmallow experiment where they put these kids on a table talking to somebody and yes. they put a marshmallow in front of them and they say i'm going to leave the room mm -hmm. you can have the marshmallow or if you don't eat the marshmallow when i get back you'll get two marshmallows, two marshmallows right. right so they studied how kids dealt with this issue yes. and the kids that were successfully got the two marshmallows were the kids who deprived their senses. Yes. The kids who wouldn't look at the marshmallow right. uh -huh. wouldn't, you know, they just distracted themselves from the desire that the senses created right. about the marshmallow. But this is the technique that you need to develop. You need to right. develop your ability to disconnect from your se what your senses will tell you. But too many people think they are their senses. Right. Well, they well, can't get beyond that. Well, it's delayed gratification. Yeah. It's delaying that, it through yeah. the sensory information. Uh, in, uh, when you said that, I can I see the little, remember the little kid that like he's he's got down on the table and he's like he's pretending like he's eating it. <laughs> yeah. And he keeps chomping, but he's not touching it. Yeah. So, I mean, to the point of like the you know the sensory information deficit, he's he's mimicking it so that he's going through the motions as a way to distract himself from actually doing because he really wants the second yeah. one. Um, I just had that image in my head. It's so cute. Um, but the delayed gratification. By the way, that was a powerful and it, that was an insightful technique. Oh, yeah. Because oftentimes, as you know, in athletics, you can think your way through muscle memory. You can Absolutely. think your way through technique. You can think your way through experiences. Yes. And it's very similar to actually doing them. Exactly. Yeah.
Exactly. And, and so, so I think that um, the delayed gratification piece, which is, an, is a multi-tiered piece of this too, but um, because it has to do with resiliency in certain kids or well, people. Delayed gratification has to do with controlling the control of your senses. Yes. Right? Being right. disciplined about how you react to what your senses are telling you. Right. So and how you your mind is evaluate how your mind is uh piecing those sen that sensory information together so well right and so i mean there's so many pieces to it but in that particular instance like it's temptation so yep. your sensory information to pass by temptation uh, you know um what is what is it that you do to you know do you give in all the time are you impulsive all the time are you building resiliency over time and that was what i was just going to say is that you find that people who have a quality of being resilient um, and, and strength-based in many different facets of their life tend to be able to delay gratification and are more likely to reap the benefits of life in general and have a healthier life anecdotally. And, yeah. and I mean, this is research on this too, but um, than people who instant gratify all the time. Because people can prioritize their intellectual desires over their Physical, physical and sensory desires right exactly yeah. because yeah. you know you, you know you, and you've had this experience and this maybe makes sense to people is that when you bypass your sensory information and delay the satisfaction of whatever it is that you finally have or eat or smell or do is amazing yeah but when you give in oftentimes what is the person's experience i hear people like oh that wasn't as good as i thought it would be or and you're like oh, i'm disappointed in that or because you just jumped into it because you didn't stay, you know, you, 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 it looked pretty, but oh, it didn't really taste very good or it looked really good, you know, whatever. Or sensory desires often revolve and, and the poster child for this is addiction. Yes. But you enjoy it the first time. You don't enjoy it as much the second time. And you spend a lot of time grinding about getting it again. And, right. you know, it's just like you spend so much energy worrying about the next time. Or if you get something like you get the nice car that you wanted worrying about it breaking down or getting in an accident you know right. you worry about losing it right yeah well and i think the addic i think addiction is a great um example of how sensory information and we're talking about the hippocampus the memory right because it helps it helps the dump of dopamine which is the pleasure center so the first time it's good yeah the second time eh, you know it's but then it doesn't matter anymore because now the memory of the of but pretty the, quickly you're yeah. doing it just to avoid being sick right you're not and, doing it for the pleasure right you're not right and so it's you know you yeah. never hear anyone who's in addiction say i want i want to remain in addiction truly you know they it's yeah. always the fight against the want to be out but the sensory information that pulls you that's why when we do addiction work with people in recoveries you know you you want to talk about triggers like in triggers people always like cringe oh triggers well triggers are really important to know because they're sensory it has to yep. do with driving by the packy that you bought used to buy your beer from or that this is the house that you bought your blah 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 your pills from or whatever it is there's right. it's all sensory information that has been stored in that cortex to give you the the um, the impetus neurologically to pull towards that temptation or go away, and the more time a person has under their belt recovery wise, and not just sobriety. I mean, sobriety and recovery are different. But these are the most primal urges we have. Right. You you, you remember where you found you remember where you found food because you need to eat again. Right. So every time you go past that spot, you you think I'm I'm going to find food here again. Right. It's, it's, this is the way we survive. Right. And so that's and so that's one of the, you know, one of the techniques is to, you know, to help people with these things is, you know, aversive, you yeah. know, make it make it not feel good, make it feel bad, you know, like when they came out with, you know, things to make you throw up or make, to to create yeah. the brain to recreate a neural pathway so that you would associate alcohol in this case, you would associate drinking alcohol with throwing up. Right there's a mixed bag of reviews on on that because it doesn't you know people just stop taking the medication so they don't throw up and they keep going back to the alcohol right. you know but um you know there's plus the throwing up isn't measured against the other things of not drinking right is a, is a minor is minor, minor compared to the right, other symptoms exactly. of not drinking yeah. um well, and so so interesting because they came up you know now they are, there's some great medications you know for being aversive but it's um, it doesn't make you throw up, but it can kill you. So, you know, because what it does, so Vivitrol and naltrexone, right? So talk about the brain parts, right, and the neural pathways. 
um, Vivitrol, which is the shot form of naltrexone, which is the blocker for opiate and alcohol, right? You can, yeah. you can take that and it cuts the cravings down because the hypothalamus in your brain, the, uh, that one of the three sections of your emotional center, the hypothalamus is where you have the regulators for that and the hippocampus has the memory of it. And when you're, um, I was just thinking of all the brain parts and I just get lost in that. Um, when, when you're having the hippocampus and the hypothalamus get regulated all the time with that, well, it's directly um, getting impacted by the naltrexone to stop it from wanting the craving or going towards the temptation and impulse. Right. So if the impulse comes into your space, you're not going to be triggered by it. However, people tempt that. And so this is the downside is like when you tempt that and a lot of people will overdose, like if they take, you know, pills or they shoot sure. up or whatever, yeah. because the body now isn't detecting the amount that you've put in and it can blow your heart out, right? Yeah. Because it can shut it down because you're not, you, you could be drunk, but your body won't really, your body will know, but you won't know. It won't right. be registering or yeah. you could be high and your body's not registering because that you won't know you've had exactly enough. the t- yeah. So it's it, the whole point is to keep people from getting the craving to go towards the temptation to fire up that part of the brain that would be, you know, anosmia. It's yeah. like a perfect anosmia for body inside. It, it cut, you know, it stops the ability for the sensory information to really be inputted in a way, completely all the way around. So it works, and it's also a deficit because it can hurt you. you know. So how do we... Um... For a couple questions. How yes. do we uh, manage these impulses? How do we manage our relationships with stimulus, sense organs? And how do we um, how do we keep alive some of the things that diminish as we go old? Last sense, a sense of smell, our sense of taste, things like that. Or is that is that a supplement routine? Is that a well? I mean, so that, that's a that's a, a lot of different pieces to answer of that. But it's so if we're talking specifically like taste and smell. I mean, we're going to, as you go older anyway, by nature of getting older, you're going to lose some of that anyway. Right. So, but, um, you know, making sure that you don't do things that are going to damage it as you go along. So if you're a smoker, don't smoke, obviously, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're a person that eats really spicy foods, um, there's some research that says eating spicy foods actually helps contain, keep it, your taste buds and your, cause it keeps your pathways open. Sure. It keeps everything really heightened. Um, You know, if you don't like spicy food, you like bland food, you know, I've seen in the research that people who eat spicier food tend to have the the nose, you know, the olfactory senses last longer, but people who eat bland food don't because it's bland and kind of has no excitement. So you think if you're excited, it's going to keep you. It's like you energize your body while it's going to keep you going. Um, You know, I say, you know, you were talking about cataracts and things like that. Obviously, you get older and things happen, but, you know, keeping your eyesight vitamins clearly you know we know that beta carotene works great for the eyes that doesn't mean you eat a whole bag of carrots yeah but you get it in different forms right um making sure you protect your eyes from the sun um you know not looking straight into the sun <laughs> um you know um it, skin same thing your skin is an organ it's a sensory organ and it's, it's your biggest organ for that so obviously skin care making sure that you don't get yourself into a space, you know, all these things over time, people don't moisturize. Uh, Psychologically, it's like, oh, who cares? It's just your skin. Well, that's why you see people that are 50. Some people are like their skin's hanging off of them. And then some people are 50 and they don't look like that. You know, it's just, it's a matter of just taking care of things sort of in a normal kind of way. Like you would do your brain, you're right. going to read more, you know, keep reading, make sure you're active, make sure you're exercising, all those things. The same thing with your sensory organs. Hearing is a little bit different in the fact that you're, we have, we have cilia with the hairs in our tympanic membrane, which is just around the eardrum. It's the eardrum and inside. There's, a ha- there's hair follicles that are how our wavelengths pass mm-hmm. when we hear things. Those have cell death as we get older, and we do not have ways of generating. That's why we have hearing aids. Right. As you get older, if there's really bad cell death in that way, um, the cilia drop off, and then there's you just don't have the neural pathways to feed that information anymore. So people end up with their hearing aids. Um, so that's one way. I mean, clearly, 
you prevent hearing loss by not you know being in loud places or wearing yeah. earplugs if you're working in a factory yeah. um or if you're you know you don't stand next to something like a jackhammer all day unless you have headphones on um I have a couple clients that have sat, you know, in like their cars and had stereos blasting for a year. You know, that's probably not good for your ears yeah. if you do that consistently or go to concerts and sit right next to a speaker. Um, so uh, common sense things to prevent sure. decline would be the best way to do that. Um, and, and just overall good health exercise it keeps your skin healthy, your brain healthy, which yeah. helps everything else. People, you know. Exercise and sleep. Exercise and sleep, it's it is the number one medication. You know, you can't you don't have to pay for it and people <laughs> would rather run out and Yep. Get it in a bottle. Okay, so give us some technique now of dis disconnecting or detaching from our sensory inputs, being totally swimming in our fears and our desires all the time. Um, so well, so yeah. that's uh, oof, it's a big question uh, because yeah. it's it's gonna be about person. A personality right of a person so but generally speaking it's really being mindful and not in the cheesy way being mindful it's it's being aware of like okay this is a choice i'm going to make by jumping into this and how is it you know really thinking through the consequences and making it like a step-by-step -step quick process of like if i do that here's what's going to happen like easy example yeah. if i eat the bagel which i love yep and i do it at least once a year I know I'm going to suffer, but I know actively, like I've said, Christmas morning, I always yeah. warn John, I'm like, I'm having a bagel. <laughs> He's right. like, oh, no, because, you know, <laughs> right? I've got but hot I'm dogs tomorrow. I'm actively going into the bagel, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, it's, yeah. It's opening day, so I've got hot dogs tomorrow. That's See? my once a year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and, but it's, it's, the, it's being aware that this thing you're about to jump into, whatever it is, is going to create some consequence and it could be good and it could be bad and it depends on you as a person of what that is you know it's like can i eat one dorito nobody can eat one dorito so don't open the bag and don't buy them but the good news about this though or isn't oreos. it do you find yeah oreos god yeah. Uh, i can't have oreos in my house the good news about this don't or you find that this is kind of like riding a bike it's it's difficult to get going at first right, but, but once, once you, you do it it becomes easier and you get much better at it yes and the reason why is because you've created a new neural pathway mm -hmm. and that's why it's not just you know it's, it's simplified people are like oh it's just because you you just been doing no it's actually because you're creating a new train track in your brain that basically shuts the other train track that was not working for you that kept getting you in trouble yeah. by eating the Oreo sleeve or doing too much drugs or doing too much shot, whatever it is, it's about creating that new neural pathway so that you can go, oh yeah, this is over time has become easier. But it won't work at all until you say, if I do that, this is what will happen. Yeah. Because people just blindly go into doing things like eating sleeves. I'm outing John eating yeah. sleeves of Oreos or <laughs> the entire thing of Girl Scout cookies. No, but you get to that point where you can do a once a week or twice a week sitting down. I'm going to do. I'm going to sit down with a book for 30 minutes. Right. And you do it, and you get that feeling, and you just start to. That you just start to build momentum. Once you realize right. you can do it, and you can get yourself into that space, and realize you have control over that, right. it becomes easy to do. Right. Well, well, and it becomes so. I'm going to back it up a little bit because people, the num I'm hearing people in my head going, um, not in a psychotic way. I'm hearing people <laughs> in my head say, <laughs> say, oh, but I don't have time. Uh, yes, you do. Yeah. I, you absolutely have time because in the way I do this technique with people is you have to put it on a schedule. Like you make an appointment to yourself that you won't, you can't miss. You wouldn't miss my appointment. You wouldn't miss that appointment with so-and-so. You wouldn't miss that line. Yeah. Yep. You just make the appointment and you have to value yourself enough to say that 10 minute block isn't going to be, you know, thrown out and given to someone else because it's right. what I'm doing. But people say, I don't have time. Well, you do have time if you're on your phone and you're texting for 20 minutes. How about splitting that in half and doing 10 minutes that's really to yourself for something else? Yeah. You Take know, that and, 20 minutes you spent on TikTok. And, and <laughs> going down the rat hole of TikTok. Uh, yeah, 
I, mm-hmm. which listen, I like TikTok as much as everybody else. It's a time suck. But this, this is about this the goes vortex ba- of TikTok. Oh god, it's unbelievable. I know. I just you open <laughs> hey, it up and really forty minutes is posts. gone. No, it's good, but <laughs> it, it, you open it up and forty minutes is gone. So, uh, but I know you start at ten o'clock at night, uh, and the next thing you know, it's midnight, and I yeah, TikTok to death. Exactly. Uh, but this is about um, awareness of what you're doing. When someone says they don't have time, it's, I, I think the same way. Like when someone says, I don't have money. Right. And it's like, if you took the time to catalog how you're spending money and realize you spend 150 bucks a month at Dunkin' Donuts, don't laugh. People do. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I Oh, I do this te- that technique with people all the time when they say they don't have money. That's the first thing. I yeah. said, let's, do, let's see how much you spend on blah, blah, blah. And I love Dunkin' Donuts. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking it. But, yeah. I, my Dunkin' Donuts. But you be, when you become aware of the amount of money that's going there, all of a sudden you stop buying tea bags. Right. <laughs> you know, you stop right. buying coffee and sort of. you, you try to cut it down a little bit. Right. Right? Yeah. But uh, that's the same thing with time. When someone so, tells me they don't have time, all right, pay attention. Catalog what you're doing right. during the course of a day. Right. You, you have 20 minutes in your day. And even if it's just a car ride, by the right. way. Right. Well, and that's, and that's the thing. And, and so that's what making awareness is, is so... When you have the benefit of having someone sit with you and like a client and do this with you, what we're talking about it is you, you, you do realize that, oh, by being aware, like, oh, yeah, the car ride can. Because people don't think, oh, the car ride or the shower or they, they, they do it automatically, but they're not right. identifying it as, oh, that's what that is. Right. So it's now just saying, like, there, here's your time to do that. Here's your time to put the music on in the shower and really do some, like, good thoughts and, like, five good things about the day or whatever it is. And so you're saying here, here it is. You can build it in. You can have that. You want to read a book. Okay. So when you get, you know, in, in bed at night, read the book instead of having the TV on, you know, do that last half hour of the day in bed as opposed to watching Baywatch. (laughs) You and Baywatch. No, well, it's just, it's a, it's a, you like David. It's a mechanism. It's just, David. it's just kind of, I don't have to think about anything else. Pamela At that particular time, well, uh, Pam. Yeah, that's the whole. The whole thing is interesting. <laughs> Looking at it in retrospect, the whole thing is tremendously interesting. <sighs> that's a whole. We're gonna do a, whole, a whole other show. show on the, the whole psychology, psychology of Baywatch. Of Lou and Baywatch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the but, fascination with old shows. Yeah, well, it's just because what happens is I'm trying to avoid getting engaged in something else mm-hmm. at that point. So you don't want something particularly interesting. You don't want something particularly intriguing. You don't want something that needs stuff from you. Baywatch, mind-numbing. It, well, yeah, it's Pringles. It's <sighs> Pringles of television. Oh, my God, I love it. And it's Baywatch or it's Star Trek Next Generation or hey, it's Dick Van Dyke. Star Trek The Next Generation. Now, there's a show worth watching over and over again. I yeah. Just, yeah, but it doesn't require a lot of you. No. Right? No, it's wonderful. It's not watching a documentary on John Wayne Gacy or watching Jersey Shore or watching I'm oh, Dating like Myself now. Yeah. I watched, or 90 Day Fiance. I Snapped. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Snapped? Yeah. We digress. I, like 90 Day Fiance, my girlfriend watches 90 Day Fiance. It triggers me. At the gym. It triggers me. I can't, I can't I watch it. It gets gym. me upset at everything. My cousin Heather and myself, we go back and forth in Snapchat while I'm at the gym about like watching it because it's always like, does that is that guy really gonna do that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's yeah. So see, but that's downtime. Like that's good it, yeah. fun downtime. For is some it? People. That's downtime for you. Well, you get triggered by. I it, get triggered. I, I think do. it's funny because it's like wow. It's like I'm going to drive to Vegas and talk to you right now. I'm just going to get in the car right now and go talk to you because you're being an idiot. Well, see, but so, but for your girlfriend, yeah. it's that it's that brain shut off to be able to have. It's allowing her like refurbish, refor- you know. Right. She's getting refurbished for the time in her brain, I think, probably, because yep. giving her down. Da- it's checking out from what is the stressors or whatever is causing that to watch something else. Or not, because it could be causing her stress too. Who knows? But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But so, so did I answer your question on on how to um, handle the temptations and the impulses? Is just by being aware first that what you're doing, and, yeah. and then following through with um, if I do that, this is going to be the consequence. And then weighing cost benefit analysis is like, is it worth it to you? Addiction will win a lot of the times when people are in addiction because the right. cost benefit analysis doesn't come into play they know the answer that this is going to be bad but if you're if a person's actively in 
it's like, well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it later next time. It, there, that's a whole other piece to it. But, but a lot of people, large, our general population, you can have awareness and say, that's not going to make me feel good or that's going to cost me a lot of money and I really shouldn't do like whatever. Yeah. Thing. A lot of people create their own stress, especially right. around money where, right. you know, they're worried about money, but by the same token, they just go online and shop and spend a right. hundred bucks. Like it's right. like it's nothing. Well, and it's always interesting because I have clients that will do that. Like talk about like over firing your limbic system and getting rolling is like, I don't have money. Like some will say, I don't have money, but then they go out and, you know, spend seventy dollars two or three times a week uh fast food or do, i'm like what? yeah you know you don't have money but or so and some will say oh i don't have that money to pay you the copay i'm like but you had money to buy drugs yeah and then they connect that like there's the mindfulness and they're like oh I'm like so if you can spend 150 dollars on drugs you can pay me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. if they don't register it the same because the cost benefit analysis is well the drugs are giving them something different than the, the therapy so i'm like well trade off here because i have to get paid yeah but in the interest of i mean drugs are one thing that's a whole different separate issue addiction is a separate issue yeah, but right doing the um going out and eating or going to mcdonald's five times a week i mean really you weigh it as a higher benefit to your cost but by, at the same token if you really stop and examine it you get no benefit no there, you, well, there is no benefit depleting your bank account yeah Right. But you're not even getting, I don't know, people aren't, people aren't craving Big Macs oh, after the third or fourth time. Oh, the people crave Big Macs. I don't. Yeah. I haven't had a Big Mac in years. No, nope. once a year. Huh? Shamrock shakes. I know you. Did you have your Shamrock shake, by the way? I did, and it was disgusting. <laughs> I was appalled I got through the whole... Well, it wasn't disgusting because I drank the whole thing, but... Clearly. I was appalled I went through... I was just, you know, it was one of those things you look at afterwards and go, what did I just do? But full circle on the show today because yeah. your memory center drives the habit to go and do your yearly ritual to get the the kick of the memory of having it, and then afterwards you're like, oh, that was terrible. Yeah. Well, it was with the kids. It was always with the kids. And th right. this last year was with my daughter. So you made the memory. We sh we had the thought. She goes, let's go get a Shamrock Shake. Right. And it's like, I love doing it and love spending the time with her. But Cause that's, that's then I look at the empty thing in. and I said, oh, my God, what did I just do? Right. So, th so that's, it. I mean, what a yeah. great way to fully show the whole show's experience today of what the concept of the neuro pathway, right, is you're associating with the good memory of being with your kids and doing something that's, you know, repetitive and it has bonded you. And, and you were aware that that's there, but you're also aware that, well, this shake sucked. Yeah. But you'll do it again. I'll do it again. Exactly. So and that so that and that's such an important part of it is that even when there's something that's not good about something, we have a a cost benefit analysis and the benefit outweighs the cost because you had this great experience despite there's a piece of it that's eh. Yeah. Next so, year I'll split one or I'll You what? Next year I'll split one or, or do something. I'll remind you of that. I'll say do don't something forget you're splitting it this year because you don't like them. And I wouldn't have done it. If it weren't for the time with my daughter, right? It was that was the whole thing, and it was just and I it, that even wasn't going to happen except to the point where she called up and she goes, "We getting a shamrock shake," and it's like then it becomes an important thing, right? You know, right? Because but the it, shake wasn't the important thing. The thing was getting together and well, spending some time with her. Well, the overall feeling that you got because what it did is it lit up your limbic system, your emotional center, and yep. your hippocampus and your hypothalamus, and said, "Oh, this feels so good," and so it gave you a dopamine rush, pleasure. Yep. yep. And it's, see, oh, you did a good job of bringing a good example in so I could wrap it all together, Lou. All right. All right so time on the wall says we are done for the day. Yes. And um, everybody have a wonderful 1st of April coming up. April Fools. <laughs> Opening day. <laughs> Tomorrow. Yep. And it's going to rain. It's okay. I'm just saying. It's not raining everywhere. There'll be ball games. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, and Baywatch. So, oh, Baywatch is Baywatch. always there. Oh my gosh, it's on um, Pluto. It's there twenty four seven. Except so they play Baywatch Hawaii, which is awful. Oh my god. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone out there is listening. Is like, oh my god, Lou with yep. the Baywatch. All right, so you guys have a fantastic week. Go out and do really good things for yourself this week, as opposed to you know. Yep. last week but go out and have a great week and I will talk to you guys next week